Hey guys, welcome back to another lecture video for Chem 104. In this lecture video, we will discuss different reactions that can occur for organic compounds that have alcohols as its functional group. So what we're going to look at is just a very, very small set of reactions. Um, the number of reactions the number of organic reactions that involve alcohols is, is numerous. And so the first reaction that we're going to look at is a combustion reaction of alcohols. And so we've discussed combustion reactions before when we were going over types of chemical reactions in inorganic chemistry. Um, and so a combustion reaction, if you recall, involves two reactants oxygen gas, and a hydrocarbon. And so typically when we're looking at uh, the hydrocarbons in inorganic chemistry, the first half of this semester, um, it was, you know, just a carbon and a hydrogen. But the addition of this hydroxyl group does not make this substance, um, it doesn't make the, the substance not flammable. And so um, alcohols such as methanol, ethanol, propanol, um, isopropyl alcohol, all of those can serve as um, fuels, so to speak. Uh, they're combustible in the presence of oxygen and heat. And so whenever you have a combustion reaction that's occurring, you do need a hydrocarbon. Okay. And so it's going to react with molecular oxygen to specifically produce carbon dioxide and water, H2O. And so the only difference um, between each of these chemical reactions that you guys are seeing is uh, the stoichiometry between the reactants and the products. And so the, the basis of a combustion reaction is some type of hydrocarbon reacting with oxygen to produce CO2 and H2O. And the rest, all you have to do is just balance the entire chemical equation. All right. And so the second type of reaction that we're going to discuss are dehydration reactions involving alcohols. And so when a dehydration reaction occurs, we're going to lose water. Um, so the starting material is going to lose water and what's going to happen is that we're going to form an alkene, a double bond. And so if we, we actually talked about this reaction in chapter 11. Um, we talked about the conversion of an alkene to an alcohol. Oops. Um, an alkene to an alcohol, and that was the hydration reaction. And so dehydration is simply the opposite of a hydration reaction. And so much like to its name, um, what we're going to do is we're going to lose water from the starting to material to form the alkene. And so the catalyst that we're going to be using to perform this dehydration reaction is actually the same catalyst that we used when we were performing um, a hydration reaction. And so it's still going to be H2SO4 in the presence of heat. And so this is, um, let's go ahead and look at this visual here. So the substance, the reactant that's on the right is representing, you know, any type of, of um, alkane compound with an alcohol. And if you treat this substance with sulfuric acid in the presence of heat, and heat is denoted as a triangle, then what's going to happen is that these covalent bonds are going to break apart and a new covalent bond is going to form between H and OH, forming this alkene. 
And so it's necessary for this alcohol to be right next to a hydrogen so that when the bonds are broken between hydroxyl group and the carbon and the hydrogen and the carbon, the hydrogen and the hydroxyl group comes together to form this water molecule, H2O. And so to kind of visualize this, even though the mechanism is, is wrong, um, but maybe this will help you kind of like uh, understand what's, what's going on with this bond, bond breaking, bond forming. Um, and so let's just say that we have this generic alkane uh, it can be, you know, any carbon number. Uh, the list kind of goes on. And so we have a hydrogen and we have this um, hydroxyl group. And so if you guys recall, a covalent bond is composed of two electrons. And so whenever a element it has a covalent bond, forms a covalent bond with another element, they're sharing their electrons. And so if through some type of, of mechanism, we won't talk about the exact mechanism, uh, the electrons were to go back to its original owner such that the bonds are fully separated, then these electrons can now interact with other elements to form new bonds. And so for instance, if I were to connect these two electrons, that forms a double bond, which you guys see here on the right. When I form, when I connect these two electrons, it forms a covalent bond between hydrogen and oxygen, forming water right? H2O. There's two hydrogens and one oxygen. Okay. And so you guys can go ahead and think about uh, the, the reaction in that sense, if, if it helps you kind of understand what's, what's happening in this um, reaction. Okay. And so dehydration reaction is an example of an elimination reaction. Whereas hydration reaction is an example of an addition reaction. And so addition reactions were adding things onto the compound. Uh, elimination reactions were getting rid of stuff. And so whenever an elimination reaction occurs, um, multiple bonds are always formed. Okay. So what we're gonna do is we're going to um, take a look at an, a specific example. And so here we have this two carbon compound. Um, and so since this is a two carbon compound and there's no substituents, we know that we're going to be using eth. Since, this, uh, um, since the bond is a single bond, we know that this is ethane. And then look, there's an alcohol and it's on carbon one. Um, and so we can go ahead and erase that and say one dash ethanol. Now the reason why ethanol typically doesn't have the one in front of it is because the uh, so this is a two carbon compound. And so if you were to kind of like, like flip it, um, if you were to write it like this, And so we're merely taking this molecule and we're kind of rotating it around the vertical. Okay, so we're just flipping it. Um, and therefore, this is carbon number one. Um, so it kind of has like this redundancy. And so therefore, we can just go ahead and just name this ethanol. Now, if you put in one ethanol, then it uh, would still be correct. I digress. And so now that we know the name of this substance, one ethanol or ethanol, um, we're going to go ahead and understand how ethanol forms the products. And so uh, because we see a hydroxyl group and a hydrogen from a different carbon, it can't, uh, 
the hydrogen must be on a different carbon, not on the same carbon as the alcohol is located. So it can't be this and it can't be this. It can be this, it can be this or this. Uh, the reason why uh, it's the one at the bottom is just because it's drawn that way. Remember that single bonds are rotatable. So these two other hydrogens are eligible if it's aligned correctly with the hydroxyl group. Okay. And so very similar to what we discussed um, <clears throat> right above, those bonds are going to break. And new bonds are going to be formed when those electrons are shared amongst those different substances. And so overall, our product is going to be a double bond and that of water. And so here, if we're looking at um, cyclohexanol, we, have, uh, we actually have two options here. So there are, if we draw all of the possible hydrogens on this molecule, okay. There's actually one more here too. <clears throat> And so I just drew in all of the hydrogens that would make all of the carbons on this ring uh, fulfill its octet. Um, and so when a dehydration reaction occurs, and let me just go ahead and add the triangle, the heat, because that's part of the prerequisite. So you're going to immerse it in sulfuric acid, and then you're going to heat it up. And so during that, that process, this alcohol can interact uh, with this hydrogen, this hydrogen, this hydrogen, or this hydrogen. Um, those are the only hydrogens that that alcohol can interact with um, to produce the product cyclohexene in water. And so just based on, on the drawing, uh, on how it was depicted, it turns out that this hydrogen is just going to interact with this water molecule. Um, and so you guys can imagine that, you know, just redraw it. You guys have the OH here, you have the H here, and remember all these electrons are being shared. And so during the course of the chemical reaction, we're not going to pay attention to the exact mechanism that's for the full year of general chem or uh, full year of organic chemistry. Somehow, in some way, um, the bond is going to be broken, and when the bond breaks, they're going to separate, and new bonds are going to be formed. So we're just going to connect the dots, so to speak. And so when we connect the new the the dots, notice that we get a double bond where that hydrogen and that OH was. And we also produce water okay, from the combination of these two. So it's pretty simple. <clears throat> now, if you look at both of these molecules, these molecules are kind of symmetrical, right? And so if I were to cut uh, the molecule in this fashion, notice the left side and the right side, they're, they're pretty much symmetrical. Um, same thing here. If I were to cut these carbons in half, they're, they're symmetrical. So what would happen if you have an asymmetrical substance? Um, excuse me. What if you were to have an asymmetric alcohol? And so with asymmetric alcohols, there's two possible two possible products that can be formed. Okay. So an example of an asymmetrical alcohol is 2-butanol. <clears throat> and so I'm just going to go ahead and, and rewrite this uh, just to show the carbons and the, the main hydrogens that's involved. 
And so we're going to understand why this is asymmetrical, first of all. And so it turns out that the alcohol is just right here, and we have a hydrogen, and we have another hydrogen. Oops. And so if I were to use the carbon that contains the alcohol as the point of reference for my reflection, okay, notice that the right side is different than the left side. So this is what an asymmetric alcohol, uh, this is what uh, an asymmetric alcohol looks like in terms of fully drawing it out. And so whenever you guys have an asymmetric alcohol, two possible products can be formed. Uh, the double bond can go on the left side of the um, carbon that contains the alcohol, or the carbon, uh, the double bond can go on the carbon on the right side of the alcohol. Okay. So just to demonstrate that, <clears throat> remember that these electrons are being shared when a covalent bond is formed. And so let's just say that somehow those bonds were, were destroyed, right? So I'm going to go ahead and, and kind of separate it out just a little bit, give it some separation. And so really this alcohol, this OH, has two choices on which hydrogen it should take. Should it take the hydrogen on the right or should it share its electron with a hydrogen on the left? Okay. And so whenever you guys have an asymmetric alcohol, um, there is a rule that will help guide you to predict the most dominant product that is expected to be formed when an asymmetric alcohol undergoes a dehydration reaction using the reagent sulfuric acid and heat. And that's known as the Zaitsev rule. And so um, the Zaitsev, Zaitsev rule tells us that the major product um, is the substance that has the most alkyl groups bonded to the double bonded carbon. Okay. So what do I mean by that? So remember how we started off this chapter by talking about like the classifications of alcohols, primary, secondary, and tertiary. Well, we're going to go ahead and apply that idea to understand uh, which side of the asymmetrical alcohol would the double bond form. Okay. And so I'm going to go ahead and, and rejoin all of these covalent bonds. And I'll just add in my hydrogens right now for completion. So I'm looking at the expanded view, expanded um, structure. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to <clears throat> identify the prime number uh, or the I'm going to classify my carbons basically based on the number of carbons it's covalently bonded to. So working from left to right, this carbon that's currently in pink, notice how it's uh, singly bonded to just only one carbon. And the rest of the stuff that it's bonded to are just hydrogens. And so um, I'm going to go ahead and, and identify that this is a primary carbon, even though there's no alcohol attached to it. Okay. And so looking at this carbon, notice that it's attached to one, two carbons, and then the other bond is a non-carbon. One is hydrogen and the other one is hydroxyl. And so since this carbon in the middle has two bonds is, is covalently bonded to two other carbons, that would be secondary. 
let me just erase those pink stuff. And then I'm just going to say that this is a secondary carbon. Now, if you were to look at this carbon that's now in pink, notice that it's covalently bonded to one carbon, two carbons. And then the rest of the stuff is hydrogens. And so I'm going to go ahead and say that this third carbon is going to be secondary, okay? Because it's bonded to two other carbons. Now, if I were to look at this carbon on the, on the right, notice that this carbon is covalently bonded to only one carbon. And then the rest of it is, covalent, is going to be bonded to three hydrogens. And so overall, I would identify that that carbon is a primary carbon. Okay. All right, so now that that's, um, <clears throat> that's kind of like laid out, we're going to go ahead and perform this, this dehydration reaction, uh, meaning that somehow, some way, these bonds are going to be gone. And so um, according to Zaitsev's rule, Zaitsev's rule um, tells us that the most, uh, the, the major product that's going to be formed is going to be the product in which the double bond lies on the side that has more alkyl chains on it. In other words, the higher the, 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 the number, the more likely it's going to form. The double bond is going to form there. And so um, this is going to be our reference point, this carbon. So if you look on the left, notice it's a primary. If you look on the right, notice it's a secondary. So Zaitsev's rule is telling us that the double bond is most likely going to lie on the side that has more uh, carbon attached to where that double bond is located. And so, um, long story short, the primary um, is going to be our minor product. And most of the time, we should expect that a double bond is going to form between these two electrons simply because a secondary is greater than a primary. Okay. And so that means that the hydrogen that the alcohol will, will interact with is the hydrogen that's found on the other secondary carbon. And that this hydrogen that's to the left of the hydroxyl will not be touched. And so overall, <clears throat> we will get a structure that looks like this. So we have a four carbon. So one, two, three, four. There's going to be a double bond between the uh, carbons right in the middle. And then the rest is going to be filled with hydrogens. And remember, the carbon must oops, fulfill its octet. <clears throat> so if you look at the product that I drew, one, two, three, four. Okay, so that's eight electrons. One, two, three, four. That's eight electrons. One, two, three, four. Eight electrons. One, two, three, four, eight electrons. So my, my resulting structure that I drew follows the octet rule. Um, and since that OH and hydrogen bonded together, we're just going to put in plus H2O. And so if you guys are looking at the two products that's possible, 
this is going to be the minor product, only a small portion of the molecules will uh, have the double bond between the first two carbons. But majority of the products produced from this dehydration reaction will have the double bond on the side that has a higher value, right? So this is a secondary carbon because it's next to one, two carbons. This is also secondary carbon. Um, there's one, two carbons. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so that's Zaitsev's rule. So what we're going to do is we are going to go through this. Uh, we're going to go through some exercises just to um, better understand this under the under the perspective of skeletal structure. So which of the following is the least likely to be isolated as a product in the reaction shown below? Okay. All right. <clears throat> and so notice that our reagent is h 2 so 4 in heat. So this is sulfuric acid in heat. And if you guys are looking on the left-hand side, we already have an alcohol formed. And so since we already have an alcohol, uh, it doesn't make sense for this H2SO4 in heat to add another alcohol. So we're going to go from this alcohol to an alkene. In chapter 11, you guys learned how to do the reverse, alkene to an alcohol using the same reagent. All right. And so um, what we're going to do is we're going to look at this structure and we're going to predict what the major product is, right? And so if we know what the major product is, then we'll, we can kind of deduce our way to see which one um, addresses the least likely to be isolated as a product. And so to do that, we're going to go ahead and do a couple things. We're going to draw in all of our missing hydrogens um, to the left and right of the carbon that contains the alcohol. So this is the carbon that contains the alcohol. To the right of it, notice that we don't really have any other bonds. We only have one bond. And so uh, keeping true to the octet rule, that means that there must be three invisible hydrogens. Okay. And so in this case, um, since this carbon is only covalently bonded to this carbon, then that means I would classify this as a primary carbon. And so I'm going to go ahead and take a look at the carbon to the left of the carbon that contains the alcohol. So I'm going to do this one in purple. And so if I'm looking at this purple carbon, I can see that it's bonded to one, two, three carbons. And so this is a tertiary carbon with one hydrogen uh, to fulfill its octet. And so according to Zaitsev's rule, if we're performing this specific reaction, this is telling us that the double bond is going to form between the carbon that contains the alcohol and the carbon that has a greater number, prime number, if you will. And so um, in this case, since tertiary is much greater than primary, then the double bond should form between these two. And so since the double bond should form between these two carbons, that means that this hydroxyl group is going to interact with this hydrogen to form water. Okay, so these are the two 
that's going to come together to form water. So the major product is going to look like this. Okay. So once again, notice that the double bond is located between the tertiary and this secondary carbon that contains the alcohol. And so during that reaction, water is lost. So this is the major product. So now that we understand the major product, which of the following is least likely to be isolated? And so um, we have some choices. Let's look at choice B. So choice B looks like our answer, which is the major product. So it's the most likely to be isolated. So that's wrong. Um, now, if you guys are looking at A, A would be the scenario if this alcohol is going to if this alcohol is going to form a covalent bond between the secondary and the primary carbon. And so in this case, that would be you know, the minor product. But it is still expected to, um, to form. Now, if you guys are looking at C and D, well, this molecule is completely different than this molecule. And so this huge difference, I mean, we're, we're adding an extra carbon, is, is the least likely to occur. And so for part C, notice that the double bond, so the alcohol was here. The double bond is supposed to be here or here. But in this case, the double bond kind of jumped, oops, kind of jumped another carbon over. Um, and so that, that product could form if there was another reaction that occurred. And so uh, in this case, it, it could form, it's not likely, but it could form. Whereas here for part D, oops, we have an extra addition of a carbon. So one, two, three, four, five, six. And so our reagent does not have a source of an extra carbon, right? There's no carbon in H2SO4. So that is probably the least likely to occur, D. All right. <clears throat> so here in this case, we're gonna go through some organic compounds, and we're gonna go ahead and predict uh, the major product. If the following compounds, or these co the following alcohols, reacted with sulfuric acid in heat. And so if I treat this molecule in sulfuric acid, and heat, that means that I'm going to go from an alcohol to an alkene, a double bond. And so this double bond is going to take place between the carbons that contain the hydroxyl group and the hydrogen to form the water. And so in this example, notice that the hydroxyl group is on this carbon. I'll change this in pink. Oops. And I'm going to go ahead and draw in um, my hydrogens. 
So one, two, three, four. Here I already have two bonds. So that's one, two more. That'll make my octet. And so remember that the, the uh, double bond has to occur between the hydroxyl and a hydrogen that's next to, uh, I'm sorry, the hydrogen that's one carbon away from the carbon that contains the hydroxyl group. And so in this case, um, it cannot, this hydroxyl group cannot form a uh, covalent bond cannot use any of these hydrogens because they're on the same carbon. And so for this hydroxyl group, um, either this hydrogen or this hydrogen can be taken. Um, and so since both of these hydrogens are equivalent to each other, it doesn't really matter which one. Uh, and it turns out that this carbon is not attached to any other carbon. So this is a primary carbon. Or a primary alcohol. And so that double bond can only go one place, really. It can only go here. Okay, so basically I'm taking this hydrogen and this OH, I'm going to break them apart uh, to form water, and then those electrons that remains goes in between carbon number one and carbon number two. And so the product that I would get, how many carbons do I have here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So this is um, <clears throat> one octanol. So the product that I would get is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So I'm gonna connect them. It's simply a double bond between the first carbon of where that hydroxyl group was at, and the second carbon where the hydrogen was at. Okay. So that's going to be our product, and then we can always add water. Okay, so that's our final answer. All right, <clears throat> let's go ahead and look at this second one. So here, if we treat this with H2SO4 and heat, and you guys can actually write this uh, this way, so it doesn't have to be H2SO4 on top. I'm just going to go ahead and write it in this form. So heat and sulfuric acid still does the same thing. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and identify the carbon that contains my hydroxyl group. and the two carbons that ad that's adjacent to it. And so this one I will go ahead and do in blue. And then this one I will do in brown. <clears throat> and so I'm going to go ahead and, and look at this uh, carbon that's in brown first. So looking at this carbon in brown, I have one two, three carbons that's covalently bonded to this carbon that's in brown. And so that would make my carbon a tertiary carbon. And since this is a tertiary carbon, I have one hydrogen. Okay, so that carbon needs one more hydrogen for its octet to be full. Now, looking at the carbon to the right of um, the carbon that contains the alcohol, um, this is, here I have one, two carbons that's bonded to this carbon. So this would make it a secondary alcohol. And so since this is a, I'm sorry, not a secondary alcohol, this is just a secondary carbon. Um, so here in this case, I have one, two hydrogens. 
on the carbon in blue so that the carbon in blue has the full octet. And so here in this case, um, when this reaction occurs, this alcohol has two choices. It can either get with this hydrogen that's on the left, uh, or it can get with this hydrogen or this hydrogen um, that's found on the right. It doesn't really matter about the hydrogens on the, hydrogens on the right. They're both equivalent at this point. Um, and so you guys are going to look at the prime number. So one is tertiary, other one is secondary. And so the major product would probably, uh, the, the, the major product would be between this tertiary carbon and the carbon that contains the alcohol. So that double bond should be here, okay? In other words, this hydroxyl group is going to interact with this hydrogen to form water. And so um, <clears throat> here I have one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. And then here, yeah, that's pretty much it. So since that hydroxyl group was here, when the reaction occurred, it'll disappear. Um, and then it will leave behind a double bond between the tertiary carbon and the secondary carbon. And so just to finish this up, we're going to write H2O. Okay, so hopefully that explanation helps. All right. So if we look at this molecule, notice that the carbon that contains the hydroxyl group is only covalently bonded to one carbon, which is on the left. So we only have one carbon to consider. So if you only have one carbon to consider, you don't really need to go through the motions. We know that that double bond is going to land between these two because there's only one choice. Whereas here, I mean, you have two choices. You can go left or right. And so when you have these two choices, you're going to have to look at these uh, these numbers. You have to determine if it's a secondary, primary, or tertiary carbon. And then your double bond is going to be on the side that has the highest value. Um, all right, so once again, uh, the carbon to the left of the carbon that has the alcohol has two hydrogens, and so since really there's only one option, probably these two, uh, the, the hydrogen on the top and the hydroxyl group on the right, it's going to come together to form water. <clears throat> and as it forms water, it's a dehydration reaction, a um, double bond will be formed. So here I have one, two, three, four, five, six, so one, two, three, four, five, six. I'm going to go ahead and connect that. And then I have a methyl group going up, going down. And so this was where the alcohol was. This was where that hydrogen was. And so for a dehydration reaction to occur, they must separate. And a double bond will remain between them and a bond will be formed between H and OH forming water. Okay. And so this would be my final answer. All right. <clears throat> and so um, I'm just going to go ahead and uh, quickly show you guys the answers for this. Hopefully you guys understand my explanations from doing other problems.
Uh, so here in this case, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So if I treat this with H2SO4 and heat, one, two, three, and this. Okay. Uh, so since this is where my alcohol was located, um, I have a primary carbon here. I have a secondary carbon here. So therefore, that double bond is going to be located between carbon number two and carbon number three. Um, and I am going to also produce water. And that would be my final answer. Okay. And so once again, if I treat this molecule with H2SO4 and heat, I'm going to go ahead and just redraw the structure. So this is my parent chain. So it looks like a W with a long thing in the middle. So this is my parent chain. Um, this bond is going is shared between the OH and the terminal carbon that's on the left. So that's not really not part of the parent chain. Um, and so since this was where the OH was, there's really only one way for me to draw that double bond, and that's between these two carbons. And so what I'm going to produce is water. So here, if I treat this with H2SO4 and heat, this was where that hydroxyl group was, and then I have that tail on the top. <clears throat> and so here, since I have two options, I can go left or right. I have to look at the um, I have to look at the numbers. And so this carbon on the left is a secondary carbon. This carbon right here is a tertiary carbon. So the double bond will most likely form between uh, these two carbons. And since this is a dehydration reaction, I am going to produce H2O. All right. So um, let's go ahead and look at, yes. So let's go ahead and look at this last set. So once again, if this is H2SO4 and heat, I'm going to go ahead and just draw the parent chain. So here I have six. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. So the hydroxyl group was right here. I'm going to zoom out. So it looks like there's two possibilities where that double bond can form. It can go left or right. Here, this is going to be um, a secondary carbon. Here, there's also going to be a secondary carbon. And so whenever you guys fall upon a situation where both of them are um, the same, then really what you're going to have is a mixture. You're, you're going to have an, uh, an equal mixture, if you will, of both substances. And so you can form a product that looks like this, or you can form a product that looks like this. All right, so going to the next problem, I'm going to have heat and H2SO4. I'm going to go ahead and just copy my parent chain, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And it looks like on the fourth, I have an ethyl group. Oops. 
And this was where that alcohol was. And so looks like I have two options. Uh, I can go left or right. And so if I look at this carbon, this is a primary carbon. If I look at this carbon, this is a secondary carbon. This is probably preferable. Um, that's a larger number. And so the double bond is going to point towards the side. I don't know what's happening. And so what we're going to get here is just H2O, and we're also going to produce H2O here. All right, so for this last example, um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So I'm just going to go ahead and just trace them connect them. And it looks like I have two carbons, two methyls, one on the second and one on the fourth. So this was where my OH originally was. And so I have two options of placing the double bond, left or right. This is a tertiary carbon. This is a tertiary carbon. And so here in this case, since I have two since both of my my uh, both of my carbons are tertiary, I'm going to get a mixture such that the presence of the double bond here is equal to the presence of the double bond there. Okay, and I'm going to get water as well. So hopefully um, you guys kind of understand how to perform a dehydration reaction uh, using Zaitsev's rule. Okay, so the next reaction that we're going to discuss is oxidation reduction reactions for alcohols. Um, and so we're going to go ahead and take a look at uh, this concept again when we talk about um, aldehydes and ketones. Um, much like we saw for hydration, there's an opposite reaction called dehydration. And so we'll see um, this concept brought up again when we talk about aldehydes and ketones. Um, so for now, to... Let me see here. So in inorganic chemistry, right, when we're talking about um, one of these earlier lectures... We know that oxidation is a loss of an electron, and reduction is a gain of an electron. That's in regular general chemistry, inorganic chemistry. How oxidation and reduction translate in organic chemistry, it's going to mean the same thing, but we can go ahead and, and um, look at it in terms of, of elements that's being lost or gained. And so... In this case, when you're talking about an oxidation in inorganic chemistry, or I'm sorry, uh, oxidation in organic chemistry, you're either going to have an addition of an oxygen, uh, whether that literally means the addition of an, an oxygen, or maybe the number of bonds between an oxygen and a carbon increases. Okay. Um, or you can, you can mark it with loss of a hydrogen. So whichever way that you guys are going to use to identify oxidation, just be consistent with it. That way you won't confuse yourself. Um, so if you guys are wanting to look at it under the perspective of uh, hydrogen, then just stick with hydrogen. Um, if you guys are looking at it under the perspective of the number, oops, number of bonds of oxygen increases, our oxygen and carbon increases, then that's going to be the definition that you're going to apply to these problems. Um, both of these will get you the same answer. Now for reduction, remember in general chemistry, reduction means a gain of electron. And so in this scenario, we're, we're gaining hydrogens. 
but through the perspective of, of oxygens and carbons, we're decreasing the number of bonds between oxygen and carbon. And so once again, just choose one of these definitions and uh, stick with it and be able to apply it in a problem type setting. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at how we can apply both definitions to understand oxidation and reduction. So let's just say that we have an alkane for now. So an alkane is saturated with hydrogens. And so oxidation, I'm going to be using the idea that oxidation is a loss of hydrogen. So instead of thinking of loss of electron, it's going to be loss of a hydrogen. And so when I lose a hydrogen, I'm going to, I'm sorry, when I undergo oxidation, I'm going to lose a hydrogen. And according to that same definition, I'm going to increase, I'm going to have an addition of an oxygen or increase the number of bonds between an oxygen, oxygen and a carbon. So both of those things are actually happening at the same time. And so here in this case, if I have just a pure alkane, if I undergo an oxidation, I will automatically get a primary alcohol. So this is something that you guys should uh, remember. If you have an alkane, and if you treat it with a chemical substance that forces the alkane to undergo oxidation, you guys are going to get an alcohol. Now, if you guys are looking at this in reverse, if you have a primary alcohol and if you undergo a reduction, then what you're going to get is an alkane. Okay. Um, and so let's understand uh, the pieces for now. So for oxidation, going back to this idea of oxidation, we're going to lose number of hydrogens. And so if you guys look at the number of hydrogens here, notice that you lost one hydrogen. And if you guys are looking at um, the oxygens and carbon, notice that there is a gain in the number of bonds between oxygen and carbon. And so once again, um, oxidation from an alkane produces, always produces a primary alcohol. And a primary alcohol means that there's an OH hydroxyl group at the very end of your organic compound. Now, if you have a chemical substance that is forcing the primary alcohol to undergo reduction, then that means that you guys are going to gain a hydrogen. So notice that we're going from two to three instead of three to two. And then we're going to lose a carbon oxygen bond. So notice that here we have a carbon oxygen bond here, there's no carbon-oxygen bond. So a primary alcohol will always produce an alkane. Okay. All right. <clears throat> what if we didn't start with an alkane? What if we started with a primary alcohol? And so if you started with a primary alcohol, then, and if you undergo oxidation, then that means that you're going to lose a hydrogen and gain a carbon-oxygen bond. Okay. Well, let's look at their hydrogens. I'm going from two to one. <clears throat> 
So I've lost a hydrogen. And notice that I'm going to gain another bond between carbon and oxygen. So notice I here I have one bond to oxygen, and now I have two bonds to oxygen. So once again, both of these perspectives, they both simultaneously describe this process of oxidation in organic chemistry. Um, and it looks like if we have a primary alcohol, if we undergo oxidation, this, oops, this primary alcohol is going to produce a new functional group, which is an aldehyde. So an aldehyde, by the way, and we'll talk about it more when we talk about aldehydes, is this piece that I've boxed. An aldehyde is a carbon double bonded to an oxygen. And on that same carbon, um, it, it's, there's going to be a single bond to one hydrogen. So that pattern, that functional group, is known as an aldehyde. And so what if we look at the reverse reaction, the reverse reaction being a reduction? Um, and so if we started off with an aldehyde, if it undergoes chemical treatment such that a reduction reaction is going to occur, what's going to happen is that we're going to gain a hydrogen and at the same time we're going to lose a carbon-oxygen bond. And so here, if we look at the numbers, we're going from one hydrogen to two hydrogens. That's a gain of a hydrogen. And we're going to lose a carbon-oxygen bond. So we're going from two bonds to one bond. Okay. All right. And so um, the moral to the story is that if you're starting off, if you have an aldehyde, and if you undergo reduction, then it's going to produce a primary alcohol. All right, and so we're going to go ahead and do one more round. Um, if you are starting off with an aldehyde, and if it undergoes, this aldehyde undergoes oxidation, it will form a carboxylic acid. So notice the carboxylic acid is very similar to an aldehyde. The only difference is this oxygen. Okay. So instead of an H, it's an OH. And so everything that I boxed is representative of a carboxylic acid. So um, once again, we can apply the concept of um, oxidation, or the, we can go ahead and apply the definition of oxidation for organic compounds. So we're going to lose a connection uh, to hydrogen, and we're going to gain a connection between carbon and oxygen. And so we're going to destroy this, this connection between carbon and hydrogen. And if you notice, that carbon is now covalently, covalently bonded to oxygen. And we're going to gain another bond uh, between carbon and oxygen. And that's what happens here as well. And so overall, notice that there is one, two, three bonds to oxygen versus here we only have two bonds to oxygen. So all of these features kind of mark this idea of oxidation. And so if you have an aldehyde, and if you oxidize an aldehyde, you will form a carboxylic acid. And we can also do this in reverse. Let's just say that our starting material was a carboxylic acid. If it undergoes reduction, that means it's going to gain a hydrogen. And then um, it's going to lose 
one connection. Uh, between carbon and oxygen. So here I have a connection between carbon and oxygen. And here on the left hand side, notice that th that connection is gone between carbon and oxygen. And at the same time, I gain a connection to a hydrogen. And so when you take a carboxylic acid and you reduce it, you form an aldehyde. Okay. So overall, <clears throat> we have uh, different transformations um, between oxidations and reductions. It just really depends on what your starting material is. So if you're going from an alkane, if you start off with an alkane, if you oxidize it, Oops. So if you're uh, starting off with an alkane and it's oxidized, you form a primary alcohol. If you have a primary alcohol and if you oxidize it, you get an aldehyde. If you get an aldehyde and you oxidize it, you get a carboxylic acid. And so we can do this in reverse. If you have a carboxylic acid and you reduce it, you get an aldehyde. And if you have an aldehyde and you reduce it, you get a primary alcohol. If you have a primary alcohol, and if you reduce it, you get an alkane. Okay. All right. Um, and so, the if we're looking at the mechanism of oxidation, uh, just between the alcohol uh, and the carbonyl compound, so just th th these two for now. Um, so remember that an alcohol is an OH group, and the carbon is going to lose one hydrogen because it's undergoing oxidation. So one of the hydrogens that's attached onto the carbon has to go. Um, and so what's going to happen is that these substances, these hydrogens, are going to uh, break and I'm sorry, these, these covalent bonds that connects these hydrogens to oxygen and carbon, those bonds are going to break. And those electrons, oops, because if you guys recall, a bond contains two electrons. So if you cut this in half, then a new connection will form between those two electrons which forms that new double bond. And then there's going to be a connection that's going to be formed between these two hydrogen, and it's just going to, hydrogen gas is going to fizzle off. Okay. Um, and so a common oxidation or oxidizing reagent is potassium dichromate. Okay. And you guys don't really need to know the exact... Um, substances, the, the exact oxidizing agents um, or reagents. Typically in the exam, I'll just abbreviate oxidation as just O with a bracket, right? And so that should just be general enough for you to understand that an oxidation is going to occur. Um, okay, so this is kind of like an example here. So if we have ethanol, and if this, since this ethanol is a primary alcohol, so notice that this carbon is only bonded to one other carbon, so that's primary. And if we oxidize it, that means we're going to lose a connection to hydrogen, and then we're going to increase a connection between carbon and oxygen. And so that connection to carbon and oxygen is right here, and then we're going to lose this hydrogen. And so what, we're, what we get is essentially, oh, we also lose this hydrogen. What we get is essentially just this portion left over, which is going to be an aldehyde. And then something happens to those hydrogens that's lost. We don't really care about them at this point in time. Um, and so when you guys are looking at 
uh, an oxidation going from an aldehyde to a carboxylic acid. Um, and once again, we're going to, actually in this case, the water is going to come in, but it's okay. So we're going to destroy this connection um, between carbon and hydrogen some way, somehow. And then we're going to reform that connection between a carbon and an oxygen. And so the mechanism to go from aldehyde to carboxylic acid, it involves um, water some way, somehow to form this OH. So you guys don't have to worry about uh, that mechanism. You just need to know the outcome, the functional group that's going to be produced. Okay. Um, all right. And so let's go ahead and talk about oxidation of secondary alcohols. Now, in organic chemistry, um, we will we love putting R's uh, where, wherever we can. So this R group just represents any carbon chain. Um, and so it can be like any carbon chain that you guys can think of, just attach it there, and that's going to be part of that organic compound. Um, and so these R groups, since they're any carbon chains, we can represent them as um, a carbon. And so this carbon that's covalently bonded to this alcohol, it's technically covalently bonded to two carbons, making this guy a secondary carbon, and thus a secondary alcohol. And so if an oxidation occurs, Remember that when oxidation occurs, you're going to lose a hydrogen. So we're going to lose this hydrogen and this hydrogen. Um, and we're also going to gain a connection between carbon and oxygen. So therefore, it would make sense for us to create another bond between that carbon and that oxygen. And this is the result that you would get. So notice that all of the hydrogens were gone in the secondary alcohol, and it's going to produce a ketone. And a ketone is another functional group such that th this uh, functional group is embedded inside, or it's, it's going to be typically found somewhere within an organic compound. And so these R groups are representing carbons, or some type of carbon chain. It doesn't really matter what that carbon chain is. So one example of this secondary alcohol is 2-propanol. And so if you are looking at this essential carbon, notice that it's covalently bonded to one, two carbons. And so since this is a secondary carbon, this is also a secondary alcohol. When oxidation occurs, it's going to lose these hydrogens, and then it's going to form a new connection between carbon and oxygen. And so the only thing that you have remaining is this compound, which is acetone. Um, and so acetone is one of those substances that is used in, in the art industry, um, it can be used as solvent, um, and the list continues. I can't remember if it's used for nail polish. Anyways, and so secondary alcohols are typically found embedded within an organic compound. So an example would be this, right? So this is a secondary alcohol. And so if this was to undergo oxidation, the product that I would get is simply a ketone that looks like that. 
And so um, the last thing that I want to discuss is oxidation of tertiary alcohols. And so since, so if we have a tertiary alcohol, um, because there's no hydrogen atoms on the carbon that contains the OH group, um, that means that no oxidation reaction can occur. So you have to have a hydrogen on the carbon that contains the hydroxyl group. And so these hydrogens are going to come together and go away, leaving you the ability to form a new connection between carbon and oxygen. Uh, so that's typically the case for secondary and primary um, alcohols. However, for tertiary alcohols, since there's no uh, carb, uh, there's no hydrogens that's on this carbon, so there's no hydrogens here, it cannot undergo oxidation. And even if you were to introduce it to an oxidizing agent, no reaction will occur. Okay? All right, so I want to go back and I want to get some practice with this. Um, so we're going to go ahead and take a look at uh, these reactions here. Mm. All right, so I'm just going to go ahead and erase erase this stuff. Okay. So we're going to go ahead and get some real practice with reactions. And so let's just say that I have this alcohol and it's going to undergo oxidation. Well, this right here is a secondary alcohol. And if oxidation was to occur on the secondary alcohol, that means I'm going to lose a hydrogen. Um, so I'm going to lose this hydrogen. And remember that there's a hidden hydrogen here. So I'm also going to lose this hydrogen. And what I'm going to gain is a connection between carbon and oxygen. So that means I'm going to form uh, another bond between carbon and oxygen so that I have, how many do I hear? I think seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And so the product that I'll get is a ketone. Okay. All right. Um, and so let's go ahead and look at this next one. If this was if this substance was to undergo oxidation, what product would I get? Well, looking at this carbon, this carbon is a primary carbon, um, making this alcohol a primary alcohol. Um, and so remember that there are two hidden hydrogens. And so when this oxidation occurs for this alcohol, one of these hydrogens is going to be lost in the carbon, um, and then another hydrogen is going to be lost from that hydroxyl group. And we're going to get a new covalent bond between oxygen and that carbon. Okay, so we're going to lose um, hydrogens, and then we're going to gain carbon and oxygen. And so here in this case, we have a double bond uh, between oxygen and that carbon. And notice that we still have a hydrogen left over on that very same carbon. And so I'm just going to go ahead and write that hydrogen here. And then I'm just going to go ahead and, and write the rest down. So one, two, three, four, and I think I have a methyl group right there.
So this right here is an aldehyde. So oxidation of a primary alcohol produces an aldehyde. Oxidation of a secondary alcohol produces a ketone. Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and look at this example. Um, here we have a secondary um, alcohol. And so we know that secondary alcohols has that has one hidden hydrogen. And so if we were to undergo oxidation, then this alcohol is going to lose um, these two it's, it's going to lose the hydrogen and so will the carbon. So we're removing hydrogens. And then we're going to go ahead and gain a new connection between carbon and oxygen. And so if you write everything that's left over, that's not X'd out, then you get a double bond between that oxygen and that carbon. And so this right here is just going to be a ketone. Okay. So once again, a secondary alcohol will always produce a ketone. And a primary alcohol is always going to produce an aldehyde. All right, um, so let's go ahead and take a look at these two over here. I'm just gonna go ahead and erase some stuff. All right, um, and so let's just say that we're gonna undergo oxidation again. What product will we get? And then here, we're gonna go undergo, you are going to undergo reduction. And so looking at the first example, uh, this carbon that has that hydroxyl group, that's going to be a secondary carbon, making this alcohol a secondary alcohol. And if we have a secondary alcohol, we're going to produce a ketone in our product. And so if we're just looking at the mechanism, we know that uh, this carbon has an extra hydrogen so we have one, two, three, four. Um, and so during the mechanism of this oxidation, this hydrogen is going to go away and this hydrogen is going to go away. And so that extra bond, if you will, is going to go to carbon and oxygen. And so what we get is a substance that looks like this, in which the ketone is the area that I just circled in pink. And so we know that those hydrogens go somewhere else. Um, they're, they're probably going to be absorbed by the uh, agent itself, the oxidizing agent itself, some way, somehow. So we don't really write H2 at the very end. Um, you can just disregard where those hydrogens go. They just go somewhere. So last but not least, here we have a reduction. And if you recall from um, my explanation of reductions for primary alcohol, so this is a primary alcohol, the, uh, when a reduction occurs, you're going to lose a connection between carbon and oxygen, and some way, somehow, you're also going to gain some hydrogens. And so basically, this OH uh, 
is just going to uh, disappear. It's, it's, something's going to happen to it. Um, you don't have to worry about that right now. The reason why is because it is out of the scope for this course. Um, and so the main idea is that you're just losing a connection between carbon and oxygen and you're gaining connection to hydrogen. So whenever, you're, whenever you have a primary alcohol and you're undergoing a reduction reaction, you're going to form an alkane. And so here in this case, we've replaced that OH with just an H. And then we know that there's two invisible hydrogens that were naturally there before the reaction occurred. Okay. So lots of reactions that's going on here. Um, and so I would personally... Uh, just memorize these trends. Um, so alcohol, primary alcohols and alkenes, primary alcohols and aldehydes, aldehydes and carboxylic acids. If you have a secondary alcohol, it becomes a ketone. Tertiary alcohols do not produce anything. Okay. And so... Um, let me see here. So secondary alcohol, ketone. Primary alcohol, aldehyde. And you can take an aldehyde one step further, and we'll talk about that when we talk about aldehydes more. And an oxidation of an aldehyde produces a carboxylic acid. Okay. And once again, tertiary alcohols, no reaction. Um, all right, so uh, just some, some quick facts here. This is uh, really cool. So feel free to, to read this article. Um, it just talks about how ethanol um, is, is absorbed in the stomach and all of the effects. And so when you guys drink too much uh, or if you guys just drink leisurely, um, there's specific uh, you know, biochemical and physiological effects that alcohol does in the body. Um, and so this just kind of outlines the overall chemical reactions that we discuss with respect to oxidation of alcohols. And so ethanol is the, uh, the, the main substance in our favorite adult beverage that's going to interact uh, with you know, liver. And inside this liver, there's gonna be some enzymes that catalyzes the oxidation of ethanol to acetylaldehyde. And um, this acetylaldehyde can be further oxidized to produce acetic acid. Oops. And so the really um, interesting thing about this is that if you consume more ethanol than what your than what your liver enzymes can can handle or deal with, it builds up this this acetylaldehyde. Okay. And so the build up of the acetylaldehyde acetylaldehyde is toxic. And this publication, if you guys open it, it's going to discuss the physiological effects of acetylaldehyde. Um, in the in your body, um, and it's actually a pretty cool and interesting read. So feel free to check it out. All right, so that's pretty much for alcohols. The next thing that we're going to discuss are ethers um, and the other four functional groups in this lecture series. All right, guys, have a good one. Bye.